Dive in the deep end, it's time to defend your movie. Hello friends and welcome to today's episode of Defending Your Movie. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. Uh, today is a special episode. Uh, I have a guest on the show who's someone that has been in my Twitter mentions for a while. You know, we seem to share a sim- similar sentimentality about the entertainment industry. And it's kind of something that just actually just fell together. But today is my guest is Russ Burning, uh, blah, blah. Russ Burning Game. Uh, he's a writer for comicbook.com, an entertainment writer, but he's also a writer of something else, which is a book on the production and subsequent fandom of Josie and the Pussycats, the 2001 kind of forgotten satire. Uh, and that, it is a movie that kind of didn't really know, or I guess I should say the advertising didn't know what it was when it came out. And therefore, as a movie that suffered because of it, you know, it's a story you've heard a thousand times of studios just not really knowing what to do with movies. Uh, But we also kind of dig a little bit into the critic response for this as well and our kind of thoughts on that. But Josie and the Pussycats, you know, based on the popular characters from the Archie comic series and is the first movie to feature live action Archie characters Uh, It was a movie that, you know, when it came out, I kind of fell into the same hole of not really knowing or caring much about it, and this was my first time seeing it. I I had seen, like, at most random scenes from the movie before, and then, you know, kind of years later, finding out that, oh, the movie kind of isn't what I thought it was. It is actually this, like, satire on commercialism and the music industry, and I was like, oh, okay, and this was my first time going back and watching the entire movie and having that perspective on it, and honestly just really enjoying it and having a good time. But uh, me and Russ, we sit down and, you know, we talk about the film and talk about, you know, why he loves it so much that he, you know, wanted to write a book about it. And, uh, you know, we had a really good conversation. It was nice to finally sit down and talk with him. And uh, I do want to say wait until the end of the episode, and you can get a special uh, discount code to purchase the book. Uh, directly from his website, josiebook.com, which all of that stuff is in the show notes, all the links to his social media, to the website where you can purchase the book. Uh, but before we get into the actual episode, why don't we clear up all the, the plugs that we need to get out of the way? Um, so as always, you can visit the Patreon at patreon.com slash defending your movie. Uh, I'm sorry, Defending Movie. I am going to do this every episode. I should have just did this all the same. I actually have an image that I have posted on social media multiple times at this point that has the links to everything. And there's actually a link tree now on the social media that has the links to all of these websites. So if you honestly go to Instagram or um, Twitter and follow me at Defending Movie. The link in my profile is a link tree to everything, so that's the easiest way to get to all my stuff. Yeah, so the Patreon is patreon.com slash defendingmovie, same as our social media, that's at defendingmovie on Twitter and Instagram, and then check out our merch store at belowthecollar.com slash defendingyourmovie. There is actually a new shirt, which, you know, if you want to be a friend of the show, we got a friend of the show shirt, so be sure to... Pick that up and show your support. Honestly, that's the best way to show support. Because uh, then if I see you out in public, I know you're a fan. I know who you are. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into our discussion about Josie and the Pussycats. All right, so I just wanted to start by you know thanking you for taking the time to come on the show. I always like to start by thanking my guests because it's time out of your day you didn't have to do, and I, you know I always appreciate that. No, no, no problem at all. It's uh, I one of the things that uh, I've been saying as I've been doing all this is like I'm more than happy to talk about the book and talk about Josie with pretty much anybody because one of the mission statements of this is kind of like getting out there to a wider audience that uh, the people involved in this movie deserve some more credit. Yeah. So, you know, I started this podcast because everybody has a movie like this 
you know, an, a movie that they love or, you know, many movies that they love that just kind of doesn't get recognition or, you know, maybe other people don't really care about, but it's just passionate to them. What is it about this movie that made you not only love it, but want to write a book about it? Well, there's a few things there. Uh, one thing is my, for, for my day job, I work in an entertainment news website. I work for comicbook.com. And one of the things that I noticed looking back at some of the like earlier stories about Josie and some of the oral history that, that they did for the liner notes for the LP and stuff is they didn't cover things in 2000s the way that they do now. So one of the things that's really interesting is I, I've been saying most of what's in this book would have just come out naturally and organically if the movie came out now because we cover things top to bottom. Everybody talks about Easter eggs till you die. Uh, you know, the smaller websites get offered uh, less uh, like marquee talent, like the, the sound design and the, the wardrobe people and all this kind of, so that like every inch of the movie has somebody talking about it. And so part of the, the, the thing for the book is literally just applying what I do every day to a movie that I'm passionate about. And the reason I'm passionate about it, honestly, has a lot to do with the, the people involved. Uh, I first watched this when it was in theaters. I was 21 and I had, like every other 21 year old straight white guy in the world, a huge crush on racially cook. It's impossible uh, not to. Yeah. Uh, and so like I, I watched it. I enjoyed it. I owned the, the VHS tape. But I largely, like, I, I wouldn't say forgot about it, but I, I would only pop that on, like, once in a, once in a blue moon for a long time. Uh, about four years ago, I was starting a podcast, and we were going to be talking about movies through the lens of, like, this video store that we used to work at. And so we were looking for an older movie to pair with a big female-fronted new release. I think it was Star Wars. And I thought, well, maybe Josie. And... Uh, that was in the back of my head. And then shortly thereafter, I saw a thing on social media where Rachel Lee Cook, uh, she was promoting some movie and somebody called her attention to the fact that, hey, there's like a Josie appreciation thread going on over here. And she like went in and thanked everybody and was super sweet. And she's like, we were so proud oh, of this awesome. movie. I'm really glad, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so I, I always say that was on Reddit. I think that's true, but I also uh, don't want to be fact checked and found out that I'm crazy. So <laughs> I remember that it happened on social media and that's all I'll say definitively yeah. <laughs> um, but in, in any event. So like I was, that really solidified for me, like, yeah, I should give Josie another look. Cause I remember enjoying it, but I don't remember it being like the kind of good that 20 years later, the cast and crew are still saying, man, we're really proud of that movie, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, gave it another watch and I kind of processed a lot of the stuff that as a 21 year old, who's watching it for the pretty girls, you don't think about very hard. Uh, and you just kind of see how smart the movie is and how well made it is. And it really, it gave me a, a whole new appreciation for it. And I became uh, kind of an advocate for the movie and it, it was equal parts, completely earnest love for the movie and embracing the ridiculousness of being a middle-aged man who loves the Josie and the Pussycats movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was experiencing a little bit of that while I was watching this because I was actually watching it at work and I would turn to my coworkers and be like, yo, have you guys seen this movie from 20 years <laughs> ago? And I know everybody was just rolling their eyes at me. Yeah, and that's it, for a while it became like a running joke on our podcast. It was just, it, we would be in the middle of some conversation and if we needed to name like a really good movie for illustrative purposes, I would always just be like Josie and the Pussycats. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, it, it, it was one of those things where I, I both earnestly loved the movie and also kind of leaned into how funny it was that me being me, that I personally loved that movie. Mm -hmm. And that, that became, at one point about four years ago, I was like, you know, I think I want to do this book because I, I thought it would be really cool to look back at the story because there's there's kind of two stories in the book. There's the story of the production of the movie, which is kind of what most oral histories are about. And then there's this second thing, which is how this movie stayed alive after being a box office bomb and how it kind of went on to become a cult classic and 
what went into that and how the fans kept it going and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I thought at the time, I was like, man, that'd be a really cool kind of thing to do as a, a book or an oral history. And I started like working up a pitch and then Mondo announced that they were releasing the soundtrack on vinyl for the first time. And one of the like bonus features or whatever was going to be an oral history written by a writer from Vice. And so I was like, well, I don't want to like step on anybody's toes and maybe this will be like better than what I'm going to do. So I'll lay off. And I got it and it was very well written and it, they got access to a lot of interesting people who honestly gave me a lot of the same quotes because when you're talking about a 20 year old movie, uh, people tend to say the same things. Yeah. Um, but it was like, you know, 12 pages. It's what you'd expect for liner notes on a record. And so uh, I, I started to think like, no, I, I, I could do more than this. Not necessarily better than this because I'm certainly not insulting the work that she did, mm -hmm. uh, but like more and a broader kind of perspective. And so I started again, kind of thinking about putting together a pitch. And by the time I was kind of ready to go to my employer, uh, they had, somebody had announced that they were doing a podcast called Josie and the Podcats, which is the story of the production reception and, and, and uh, uh, legacy of this movie uh, in oral history, for, or not in oral history form, in podcast form. Yeah. And so I, I basically, same thing. It's like, I'm interested in this thing that has a really niche fandom. I don't ever want to be the one who's like cannibalizing somebody else's thing. And so I was like, well, I'll wait. And after the show, if I still think that there's something I can do that they didn't cover, then I'll do my project. And so I listened to Josie and the podcast. It was a terrific resource. Uh, there's some stuff in there that I would never have known without it. But, uh, when it was done, I still was like, no, I, I, this isn't exactly what I wanted to do. This isn't the thing I had pictured in my head. So I, let me do this. And I reached out to the, the host and the producer of that show just to make sure, Hey, cause they're journalists and authors. I was like, you're not going to do like a book to follow up the show. Right. If I do this, I'm not going to be messing with anything. And they said, no, man, you be, you go, go do it. <laughs> um, and so it's been like this four year journey to uh, getting to the point where I started the book. And then uh, it's been about a year since I started writing. Oh, that that's super I actually i'm gonna check out that podcast because i love stuff like that um yeah and they're it's terrific and they do a lot more than i do in the book about the history of the property as animation uh even though the cartoon is really what brought josie to most people's attention i just kind of glance over it because most of my first chapter is about the comics and then about a lawsuit between the creator of Josie and Archie comics that happened in 2000. Uh, and then I do talk about the cartoons briefly, but then I move largely right into the movie itself. And so uh, it's certainly, if nothing else, the first two episodes of Josie and the podcasts are terrific resources for like people who want to know a little bit more about the early days of this property uh, they talked to one of Bob Montana's daughters. Bob Montana is the guy who created Archie uh, and was the guy who drove the house style at Archie Comics for the first like 30 years of the characters. Yeah, like I so Archie Comics was always like I am a comics person, but Archie Comics was always a blind spot for me. And to be perfectly honest, the most interaction I've had with that as a franchise or anything is Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Riverdale. And I'm talking the Melissa Joan Hart, Sabrina. T. Right. Netflix. Yeah. Um, so were you like, were you a fan of the cartoon or the comics when it came out? Or was the movie just kind of one of the first things you really got into with this? The movie was the first thing I was really passionate about. Uh, growing up in the 80s and 90s, I saw the show in reruns a lot. In fact, I would argue that because there was really there was only one season of Joe's and the Pussycats and then a second season which was called Josie and the Pussycats in Outer Space. <laughs> and so there was only As two seasons. Yeah, exactly. There was two seasons total, and then they had an appearance in a Scooby-Doo like, TV movie, and that was it. And people who grew up after the shows were over, uh, like myself, really, I, I thought at least, that this show went on forever because it was syndicated in reruns forever. Yeah, I, I've assumed that about so many of those old shows and you go back and like, oh, there was like 20 episodes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly like I, I 
I had watched it and enjoyed it, but I also, you know, one of the, one of the folks I spoke to in the book referred to the cartoon as Walmart Scooby-Doo. And there's definitely an element of that. It's a mm-hmm. Hanna-Barbera cartoon. They use a lot of that same interstitial music and a lot of the same recycled animation techniques. Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoyed it, but I enjoyed it mostly as like, as a kid, especially kid growing up in the eighties, when you didn't have 57 channels, I really, uh, it, it was less that I really loved it and more that it was something to watch that I didn't actively dislike. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I, I knew of it from the cartoon, but that's not where I fell in love with it. I really fell in love with it, with this movie. Um, I did become like an Archie fan independent of the movie around, uh, it was after the movie, but, but kind of my interest was independent of it around the time, uh, that John L. Goldwater took over and, uh, they started really changing things up. So about 15 years ago, uh, they, you know, that's when they introduced Kevin Keller and they started really bringing in kind of a more diverse cast of characters. They started writing a little bit more towards the comics direct market so that you were writing stories that appealed more to all ages instead of just kids. Uh, you know, ultimately, I think that they had the new Riverdale initiative, which went kind of completely the other way and was designed explicitly for teenagers. Yeah. But uh you know, the, I, I became a fan of these characters during an era where they were just kind of getting out of the stigma of being exclusively for children, children, and starting to write for, you know, young adults, young at heart, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're, you are a little older than me. And like, for me, it's like, I... I did always just kind of write off a lot of that stuff. I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's for kids. And I, I you know, I, I would watch Hanna-Barbera cartoons and I'm sure I saw Josie and the Pussycats, but I was way more Scooby-Doo and um, like Flintstones and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so for this, this movie, what do you th- think went wrong? I guess and it's kind of a broad question. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's, it's fair. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things. I think the biggest thing, honestly, and people are pretty frank about this in the book that I wrote is Universal didn't know how to market the movie. And like when a movie underperforms, it's really easy to blame marketing. And everybody was kind of trying to stay away from being like, oh no, those guys are really crappy at their job. It's less that, and it's more that the studio couldn't decide, you know, it's a PG-13 movie. It's a really smart script. There's a lot of satire in it. It -hmm. really probably should have been aimed at very squarely at like the MTV audience of the time, you know, at 13 to 24 year old kind of demographic. Uh, They wanted to market it more towards kids because at that point, Archie was very much considered a kid's entity the there was no like Josie was not a popular comic or anything at the time so for a lot of people the only cultural touchstone they had was the 70s animated series which was again very squarely aimed at like four to ten year olds and so they really had a difficult time figuring out like do we go for the nostalgia audience do we go for the like the teen like too cool for school audience like what who are we trying to talk to and as a result I think that they just didn't talk to anybody yeah, uh, I did, did watch do... the trailer for this like right before we started recording, and th- it's like for a different movie. Like it literally yeah, just the... feels like it's a, uh, it's, it's try like you said trying to pull in like the young girls like romantic comedy audience, and that's not what this movie is at all. Yeah, it. I always compare that trailer to like it feels like it should be a trailer for Spice World. Yeah, uh, which came out shortly before this, and actually also starred Alan Cumming. But uh, it it really, like, if you watch that trailer and then you watch this movie, you might go in expecting, like, I'm going to enjoy it because I really like thing one. And then you're going to realize that a third of the movie is explicitly making fun of that thing. And so they basically invited people into the theater under the pretense that, hey, we're not going to make fun of you. And then they totally did. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, a lot of the folks I spoke to who were young girls at the time when the movie came out felt that someplace that Hollywood fails them a lot is 
trusting young women like with comedy like they they feel like you have to be handheld or it has to be a very specific kind of thing and one of the reasons they like this movie is because it trusted them and yeah. the marketing certainly did not feel that way no and the, like this movie which i so i had seen bits and pieces of it i think over the years like i remember when it came out there's one scene in particular which is when they're at the big party for their release and Tara Reid's yeah. like leaning on the O or whatever and like that was like one of the first things I ever saw from this movie and I was like oh you know it seems this seems okay and then years later like kind of learning like oh it was actually like this satirical movie and stuff and I do love satire and I was just like oh okay well that's interesting and I, I never went back and watched it until I did for this podcast and even in 2021 I found this movie absolutely hilarious like there were yeah, it, m- multiple times I literally like laughed out loud when I was watching it it's funny because there's a lot of jokes that are very much of the moment and so some of that stuff gets lost on younger audiences or on just you know even people who were old enough at the time but like it's a 20 year old joke now yeah, I, I do think the, as I was watching it, I was like, oh, this movie will age out of its cult status at some point. Like once people like us who don't remember that time period aren't really around, like I don't think a, like younger kids would really get anything out of the movie. Well, it's funny. I think that the, the other side of that is that the, the satire, the satirical elements that didn't connect with audiences initially are more timeless and are part of what's driving its kind of renaissance. And so I think that that'll dra- that'll that'll keep the movie more relevant for longer, mm-hmm. uh, because I you know I do think even if you're you know you're talking about specific product placements in 2001, that's one thing. But really, the meta commentary, like a, a lot of the younger people I talked to for the book, were applying it to like Instagram influencers and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you like it really is something that it, you're right. Eventually, that's going to happen because that happens with all satire. But uh, a lot of the jokes that clicked in 2001 don't click as much now, whereas a lot of the cl- jokes that the audience did not connect with back then are what has made it a cult classic now. And I find that dynamic kind of interesting, too. Like, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, you might be right on the edge of the age where this was on your radar or relevant to you in any way, shape or form. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where Valerie and Melody are being attacked by... Carson Daly. Yeah, and and Aries Spears. Spears. And uh, a big, like, during the course of the fight, they stop so that Melody and Carson Daly can flirt. Yeah. Uh, Which I think to modern audiences, you just watch that and it seems like she's using being a pretty ditzy blonde girl to her advantage in the fight so that she can beat him up. But the extra layer of that joke in 2001 is that those two were engaged. Yeah, I and did. I did learn about this. Thing. Yeah, uh, they actually they they sent me a big box of behind the scenes photos so that I could pull some photos of Debs for the book, uh, and and there was a bunch of really cute pictures of Carson and Tara, and I was just like, these are tempting because like they're so of that moment, but I don't necessarily want to share a bunch of like cheerful romantic uh, pictures of a couple that's broken up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's <laughs> a weird feel like my gray area. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really interesting, like stuff like that, where at the time that was a thing that everybody kind of talked about and joked about, but as the movie ages, fewer and fewer people remember it was ever a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware of it until I did, you know, my little bit of research after watching Mm -hmm. the movie, but like kind of, you know, knowing it now and looking back on that scene, it's like, oh, that's, that's kind of fun and plays into the, how the real world is kind of portrayed in the movie. Yeah. And it's also one of those fun things where like, because Tara has just had just come off of American pie and TRL was like enormous. They were one of the it couples. They were, they were a huge, like they were a huge tabloid sensation. And so the idea of like kind of playing with that and making fun of that, but not openly acknowledging it was a thing that a lot of people were like, no, that really clicks with me. (laughs) Yeah. Also, the first thing they shot in the in the entire movie was uh, the scene where Carson's on the set of the real TRL, uh, where he's all bandaged up because <laughs> Melody beat him up. And uh, 
the, one of the funny things about that in a movie that's all about trends and how uh, corporate marketing uh, changes these things on a dime. They shot that at the beginning of the film. And then like six weeks later, TRL changed their set. So that by the time the movie oh, wow. came out, it was the old TRL set. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Uh, so it's like one of those weird, like, ha ha, it works in reverse. Yeah. Uh, you think they would like be on top of that? <laughs> um, do you, do you think the cast was kind of the thing they were relying on, you know, with Rachel Lee cook coming off of like, you know, it's a few years, but she's all that it was like a huge movie. And, um, I don't know where this was in relation to American pie for Tara Reid. I assume around it the was- same time. It was so close to American Pie that she over, shooting overlapped on Josie and the Pussycats and American Pie 2. Oh, okay. In fact, the reason that there is a Eugene Levy cameo in this movie which is was great. because, <laughs> yeah, which is one of my favorite. And it's, I can't remember who was in the script. They had a lot of like ideas for like, maybe it'll be this person, maybe it'll be this person. They weren't really committed to anybody yet. And then they landed on Levy because they realized like, oh my gosh, it's a universal movie. We have the same production executive. We could actually get Eugene Levy. Yeah. Uh, But that was, it was literally like the reason that happened, like that scene is shot on the back lot of American Pie 2. Like those fake sets that he's walking past are actually real sets for American Pie 2. Oh, wow. I'm surprised. Honestly, for how many times I've seen those movies, I'm surprised I didn't pick up on the sets. I'm pretty sure that they made sure to like only shoot the back of the set. So all you saw was the flats and you couldn't identify. Oh, uh, okay. Cause I feel like they probably worried that like, this is not something they told me, but if I was thinking about it hard, they probably worried that acknowledging the existence of American pie might break the fourth wall a little bit more than even this movie wanted to do. Which yeah, they do a couple times. Uh, I think the main one being the character stating that, Oh, I'm here because I was in the comic book. Yeah, yeah, which uh, which is a joke that came up because the the directors at one point were like, "Why are these guys here? Like, there's no reason they would be on this plane. They they should have yeah. left by now." Uh, but it was they were key to the Josie mythology in the comics and the cartoons, so it was like, "No, but we got to have the Cabots with us the whole time." And so the uh, I'm here because I was in the comic book joke is essentially just lampshading the fact that like, yeah, there's really no purpose to these characters narratively. It's just to have these characters that people care about. Yeah, which I've I've always been a fan of. Um, what's his name? Paulo Costanzo, who plays Alexander yeah. Cabot, because I yeah. was a fan of the Animorphs TV series, because that was oh, like wow, my yeah. favorite book as a kid, which I, I still have like all of those books in storage. But um, I was I was like, oh, he played a character on that show, so whenever he pops up in something, I was always like, oh, what's that dude? And I didn't know he was in this, so even that watching it now was kind of fun. Like, there's a lot of really good cameos in this movie. And yeah, uh, the, the Eugene Levy might have been one of my biggest laughs of the movie when she like he's like, hi, I'm actor Eugene Levy. And then just immediately complains about the cappuccino. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. I uh, when I because I, I crowdfunded this book because uh, I needed to pay to get dozens of hours of interviews transcribed. Yeah. And I the video that I made for crowdfunding, I immediately aped the uh the, the eugene levy where he comes out and hi i'm eugene levy and i am an ac- actor uh <laughs> i i did that in my video where i was like hi i'm russ burlingame and i'm an author <laughs> <laughs> oh it's so uh, good yeah that's it, it's funny because i think that my favorite cameo uh and this might just be biased because he was really fun to talk to and because this is the one of the director's favorite cameos but uh do you remember the the thing on vh1 behind the music where they had the captain to kneel and the chief. Yeah. So the, the chief, the guy who uh, got essentially booted from the band and had all of his credit stolen by the captain yeah. is played by uh, Kenny Babyface Edmonds, who is like one of the, the greatest producers in like modern music history. Uh, and who also produced the soundtrack for this movie. And his wife, Tracy was a producer on the film itself. Uh but yeah, the, seeing Kenny Babyface Edmonds dressed up like an old man and like pushing a mop around dejectedly was just hilarious to me. <laughs> yeah, that was a really funny scene. Um, honestly, like the entire cast of this movie is kind of an amazing just cast of character actors. Like Alan Cumming oh, yeah. is just 
stealing every scene he's in as he usually does in movies um you know parker posey is for me she's one of those people that is hit and miss but when she hits she usually hits very hard and this one yeah. absolutely works for me yeah it's funny um i didn't get a chance to talk to parker because parker is incredibly busy all the time uh oh, she's always but, working yeah uh, but it's funny because like one of the things that I'd kind of forgotten until I was talking to Rachel Lee Cook was uh, Rachel played the younger version in flashback of Parker's character in House of Yes. Yeah, I actually and just read so, that right before we started recording. Yeah. And so it was this thing where uh, when Parker came to be in Josie, it was this like moment for Rachel where she was just like, oh, my God, like this is so incredible because like, not only is this person I admire going to be in the movie, but it's like, you know, five years ago, I was her like flashback person. And now she's playing in a movie where I'm the lead. And it feels like this really important moment where like you, you have a, a relationship that's building on like a continuum. <laughs> um, and so everybody, and you know, Alan Cumming had just directed his first film, the anniversary party, which Parker was in. And, uh, uh, Hiro Kanagawa, who is a, a brilliant character actor from Vancouver, who uh, you might recognize from things like iZombie. Uh, he had been in Best in Show with Parker the year before. And it was like everybody, it, even though I didn't get a chance to talk to her, almost everybody had at least one really good Parker story because she apparently was just a delight to work with. Yeah, I, and like everybody in this movie has worked together in other projects. Like you have Seth Green and Donald Faison and Brecken Meyer who have all done multiple things. Eugene Levy and uh, Tara Reid. Like this movie, mm-hmm. and then the directors um, who also directed a movie I love, which they've only directed can't two movies. Wait. Yeah, Can't Hardly Wait, one of like my favorite like kind of coming of age movies. And yeah. You know, a lot of the people that are in this were in that. Like the the one guy from DuJour who I didn't know, I didn't realize he was the foreign exchange student from Can't Hardly Wait. Yeah. So you want to hear something really cool about him, uh, which uh, I I figured out much later than I kind of care to admit. What's that? So, every, you know, again, DuJour is a boy band. There's four members. It's Donald Faison, Brecken Meyer, Seth Green, and Alexander Martin. And everybody who watches the movie without knowing who Alex is, is like, it's the three famous guys. And this one also ran. Yeah. Which plays into the dynamic of the actual band in the story where Les is like the not talented guy. Who's clearly like, just kind of the extra, you know, the plus one. Yeah. Uh, In real life though, Alex Martin, his mother is uh, Olivia Hussey who uh, if you grew up in the 80s or 90s, you probably saw her every year in your English class because she was the definitive Juliet in uh, that, the Italian version oh, of Romeo. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was made in the 70s. And, uh, and Alex's grandfather is Dean Martin. Oh, wow. And so in spite of being the least famous member of DuJour, Alex is like Hollywood royalty and probably a billionaire. <laughs> that's crazy and i was looking yeah. him up and like he doesn't have a ton of credits on imd no he's i think honestly i don't think he was a huge like was huge into acting i think he did it mostly because he was friends with all those guys yeah like i when i talked to to breck and one of the things i it didn't make it into the book because it doesn't translate as well on the page and i worried it would come off as course mm-hmm. uh brecken was saying that like they all went to high school together and he can remember like the days when the VHS cart would be rolled in and you're about to watch Romeo and Juliet. And <laughs> Alex was like, do we really have to watch my mom naked right now? Cause that's kind of weird for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Uh, so like they've been friends long enough for Brecken to have those stories. And so I suspect that it was less about like, he wants to be an actor and carry on the family legacy and more about he's friends with all the guys in these movies. He's, got the capability to do it so why not yeah i yeah and even in the movie he he doesn't have very many lines and i i I found it strange that when they come back at the end which was a funny moment i actually wasn't expecting um (laughs) like he's the one that's kind of like the the one in front of the group and everybody else is just in like full body casts 
that that was literally a scheduling thing. Uh, they oh, only okay. had they only had the boys for like three days, and then I think uh, Brecken had to run off and do a uh, rat race or something. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, which also rat race got mentioned in your last episode, I think. <laughs> um, but, oh yeah, uh, we yeah because we were talking about uh, like ensemble cast. Which rat race? I I love yeah. rat race. But uh, so they had the boys for two days. It was basically the day on the tarmac and then the day in the plane. And uh, with Alex, because he didn't have another project coming up, he was able to come back and do, or I think he came early to do that because also Parker had a really busy shoot schedule and they had to shoot her out early. And so they had this weird thing where it's like, you only have the boys for a couple of days, but those days have to overlap with at least one with Parker so that Alex can do the scene at the end of the movie, blah, 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 blah. Um, But yeah, so that's why he was the one, the only person who wasn't in a body cast was literally just because they didn't have the other guys for those, for that day. Mm -hmm. And of course the, it's one of those great, like uh, necessity is the mother of invention moments because like the, the Metallica joke in that scene is (laughs) one of the best. Like, I remember that being one of the things I laughed the hardest at in theaters. Yeah. That, that one got me really good watching it this time too. (laughs) Uh, And yeah, you look at the, that group of guys, they were all like, at the peak of their careers at that time, like Seth Green doing like Austin Powers and stuff, Donald Faison. I think that was like pretty early on into Scrubs or just about to start Scrubs. I think it was just about to start because they shot the movie in 2000. And I remember season one of Scrubs. If you listen to their podcast, they talk about one of the episodes filming during 9-11. Yeah. Uh, but both Brecken and Donald were, you know, a couple of years removed from Clueless. Yeah. And so, and Donald, of course, was the one headlining Clueless TV show after the show ended. And so it was like they were TV show. Yeah, they did it. I think it was three seasons of a Clueless TV show. And it was like not very many people came back, uh, but it was like Donald and Stacey Dash and one or two other people from the movie. And then a whole bunch of other folks who obviously, you know, they hired just for the show. Yeah. Yeah. and I don't, I, I, I know I saw a couple episodes. I remember almost nothing from it. I just know that it existed because Donald talks <laughs> about it on Scrubs podcast a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, but, it would be also be yeah. post remember the Titans the year before. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I, ironically, I think that the, the least famous lead in this movie at the time was Rosario. Yeah. Uh, like you know, I done kids and I think she might've done, he did, he got game by then. Yeah. But, so that was before this. But she like she was shooting Pluto Nash before this, but then that movie <laughs> fell into such a morass of trying to edit it to be watchable that Josie, I think, came out before Pluto Nash. So it's like you shot your big blockbuster uh, movie debut and then your next one and the next one came out first and then both of them flopped. And it's kind of a minor miracle that Rosario is still a star today. I mean, was Men in Black 2 her, like, first big movie? Yeah, I think that might have been the first big movie that was actually a hit, at least. Yeah. The first movie I remember seeing her in, I don't know if anybody even knows this movie, but it's called The First 20 Million is Always the Hardest. And it's just this, it's a really strange comedy that I, it was, I think it was one of those, like, saw it on HBO late one night or something. And it's, yeah, the, it's like Rosario Dawson and uh, Jake Busey and like a, uh, Ethan Supley and like a couple other people. Oh, now you're saying this. I, I never saw it, but I, having managed a video store, I can remember the cover art now. Yeah, <laughs> it's I remember it being good at the time, but I was young. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about in retrospect. I would I wouldn't mind revisiting it. But that was the first thing I remember seeing her in. And that was after Josie and the Pussycats. But I didn't I didn't see, you know this was yeah. my first time watching Josie. So yeah, I definitely, I think Josie's probably the first thing I saw her in, or at least the first thing I registered her in. I know that I watched kids and he got game, but I think I watched them both on VHS years later. Um, yeah. Certainly kids was never like I, I, that as, as critically acclaimed as it was, it never connected with me in any way. And yeah, so I never, I never saw kids. So yeah, the, I, it's funny. Uh, I, I was not a huge fan of that. And then years later, when I was managing a video store, the owner of our store almost got into a fist fight with Larry Clark at <laughs> a video convention. And it wasn't like 
content related. It wasn't any, like it wasn't money. It was literally just like, I think, I think Jim tripped over him while he was bent over. And oh, <laughs> so literally just like um, an accident. Yeah. It was literally just one of those dumb, like two people bump into each other, but one or both took it way too seriously. And then like they came back and his wife was like, you should have seen these idiots. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, what, one thing that I think that this movie reminded me of that I kind of miss in like modern movies and, and maybe it's specifically comedies is the, the power of a flip phone. Like I <laughs> love Alan coming in his phone in this movie. And like so many great moments just come from him opening and closing his phone. Yeah, no, that's definitely a thing. It's funny because it's kind of like slamming the phone down, like slamming the receiver down on an old analog yeah. phone. Like you never get the like anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, I literally, I have an old phone on my desk just so I can do that. <laughs> Works out uh, perfect. But yeah, like just hitting actually, a button yeah, I, on a touchscreen isn't the same. Yeah, there's no way to like convey like real rage when you when you slam on your screen with your pinky finger because it just no matter what you just look like a petulant child. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and it's great because uh, if you watch the the blooper reel at the end of the movie, there's a shot where Alan's phone breaks in his hands as he's trying to do one of those <laughs> i missed that one and it's just like yeah that's it's the two things it's the fact that like oh yeah i remember when you could do that and it was kind of a cool like it was visually interesting you yeah. know i wouldn't go as far as to say cinematic because it's still a very small movement but it was more visually interesting than anything you can do with a touch screen but then like you also have the added bonus of like oh yeah and then in the blooper reel you see it fall apart in his hands <laughs> yeah well, because if, if how many takes they're doing, he's probably just wearing out the hinges on those things. Well, and especially in it, the one where it broke was the du jour scene, and uh, talking to Alan and Brecken about that scene, like it was a lot of improv and a lot of messing around in a long day. Oh, it and shows. So, and so, like, it's one of those. Actually, here's a fun thing that I got to tell members of the cast and crew because I figured it out, uh, and they didn't know it. So uh, Olivia Hussey, after her, uh, after Dean Paul Martin passed away, uh, mm -hmm. had a, a moment where she spiraled and had some mental health issues and some drug issues and things. And she eventually found her way out of it with the aid of this guru whose name was Muktananda. And so there's a throwaway joke on the du jour airplane where Donald Faison is complaining about the monkey. Yeah. And he's like, first he pooed on this, then he pooed on this, and then he pooed on my picture of Swami Muktananda. <laughs> and I didn't like I like everybody else, I just assumed that was like a random name or a joke name or whatever yeah. for a long time. And then I read uh Olivia Hussey's autobiography, which she co-authored with Alex. And she talks at great length about her love for Muktananda and how important he was to her life and how like she still sees him in dreams and things. And the next time I watched Josie after that, I was like, holy crap, it's a Swami Muktananda joke. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that was like two days before I talked to Harry and Deb for the first time. And I was like, did you guys know who Swami Muktananda actually was and like the relevance of that joke to Alex Martin? And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I there's a, the the du jour stuff was kind of the moment where I was like, oh, I'm going to love this movie, which, you know, it is yeah. the opening of the movie. But obviously so many references to like sex and them possibly being gay with their music. And they're, yeah, they're, it, the one moment that kind of got me on the plane is when Donald Faison, I think he's complaining about the monkey. Like he's like, he keeps playing with my two little balls. And I'm like, are those supposed yeah, to be Benoit actually balls? The, the yeah the they were but that was he just calls him my two little balls but also that's that's one of the things the monkey pooed on so you're talking about yeah. the same joke <laughs> um yeah the the du jour stuff is is wonderful and of course it's funny uh depending on the age and awareness level and everything else of the person watching the movie uh if you go to tiktok you can find more than a few videos of girls who are like 30-ish now who would have been yeah. 10 or 12 when the movie came out who are listening to backdoor lover and being like <laughs> oh my god 
oh, that's what that was about. Yeah, I want to <laughs> say I actually, you know, I TikTok is my nightly before bed scrolling on my phone. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I had heard that on TikTok. So when I watched the movie, I was like, oh, I, I for sure know what I mean. I mean, I know what they're talking about anyway, but like it yeah. sounded familiar to me. And now you yeah. saying that it's all over TikTok makes sense. Yeah, it's one of those. I mean, I wouldn't say all over, but certainly it's one of those things that I've stumbled across at least two or three. Uh, and only one of them was something that somebody directly pointed me at. Yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, whole sequence, I was just like, oh, like I immediately understood what the movie was. And it's was also surprised. funny. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no worries. Uh, you can finish up because my thought can wait. <laughs> well, I was just surprised that you know, this being a movie that is an adaptation of a younger skewing comic book and television series of how adult and kind of grown up the, the nature of the writing was. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, one thing is that they they turned down the movie a couple of times before they finally said yes. Uh, there was somebody at Universal who watched Can't Hardly Wait and was like, no, it's you guys. That's who we want for this thing. We think you're perfect. Yeah. And they were like, they had already written a screenplay for a very Brady sequel. And then they did a rewrite pass on Flintstones and Viva Rock Vegas. And so they were acutely aware that they didn't want to become those people who just like adapt other people's IP. Yeah. And so it wasn't until they realized like, oh, they're going to give us $25 million to make a studio musical that they finally kind of landed on a take that they liked. Uh, oh, the, the du jour thing that I was going to say before, which is, is worthwhile because it speaks to one of the things I really, that immediately hooked me about the film was it's hard to remember this now, but in 2001, it was really uncommon for studios to let filmmakers mess with their opening logo. Yeah. And so the fact that the MGM lion was still on screen when they started singing backdoor lover and everything started to go <laughs> leopard print. I just remember sitting in a theater in 2001 and being like, Oh, it's that kind of movie. Yeah. Because back it, then, it, like nowadays that's super common, but back in 2001, that was like a statement. Yeah. The studios are super protective of that stuff. And you, yeah, you, you get away with it a lot more nowadays. And just the way like opening credits have evolved in movies now, like it, it's a lot different, but yeah, I didn't, that's, I did not think about that watching it. That is actually kind of wild that they got away with that. Yeah. And again, like I, th I think part of the reason you don't think of it now is because every single DC and Marvel movie opens like that. And you know, it's really just the last 10 or 12 years that they've it's become an accepted piece of film language that like, Oh, we can establish ourselves as sassy by having pop music and discoloration play over the, the Columbia logo or whatever, you know, I, I would say one of the best examples of that, that honestly, I'm surprised they got away with it is the Lego Batman movie because it's yeah. literally just uh, what's his name? Um, planking from Batman. Arnett. Yeah. Will Arnett. Um, it's literally just him dunking on Warner brothers as yeah. the Warner brothers logo is popping up. Yeah, my favorite, uh, which isn't quite as subversive, but is also kind of like, huh, I'm kind of surprised they did they got that, was the Spider-Verse one where they got to flash back and forth between the like 40 different iterations of the Columbia logo. Yeah. Yeah, that that uh, yeah, that movie does a lot of cool stuff in the opening and like flashing the old like comics code stuff and Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I like when movies are allowed to get weird with it and do stuff you haven't seen before, even with just their logos. Yeah, and I think that was one of the things that happened with Josie that led to it struggling with audiences. Because one of the things that is worth pointing out, because now that this movie is kind of an accepted cult classic and a lot of people look back and they're like, oh man, all those reviews, oh man, the promotion, oh man, the like it wasn't a movie that like got an A plus cinema score and it was only critics who didn't get it. No. Like certainly a lot of critics didn't get it. You know, uh, famously Roger Ebert. Uh, had a review where he said something along the lines of it's not dumber than spice world but it's as dumb as spice world which is enough for me yeah uh, i i but, did kind of uh flip through some old review stuff and very unanimously seemed to just go over every reviewer's head 
Yeah, that was the weirdest thing to me. Uh, like, it's it's one thing, because, like, again, like, with audiences, you kind of expect that a chunk of people won't get satire, even if it yeah. is. Like, it seems really blatant in this movie. I'm shocked that people didn't get it, but you do kind of It almost seemed like it was audience. on purpose with uh, critics. Like, they were just, yeah, like, that's... blatantly ignoring it. Yeah, and certainly I do think there's an element of people... I don't know if it would be necessarily blatantly ignoring it, but certainly saying, like, oh, well that's probably an accident because it's not that kind of movie. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a, a, a quote that I pulled from entertainment weekly where uh, just before the movie came out, they did a cover story on like the summer movie season and Josie and the was on the cover and they talked to Rachel and she had some very articulate quote where they were like, where she was basically like, you know, a lot of people are looking down on this movie because it's based on this cartoon about like girl pop stars but actually it's this really smart, really sharp satire about our consumer culture and uh, how people allow themselves to be identified by brands and blah, blah, blah. Like she gave, she gave this really good, really articulate, you know, 50 word quote about like why the movie is interesting and important. Yeah. And then Entertainment Weekly followed it up. That quote ends. And the next line from the reporter is, yeah, right. With babes in cat suits. Uh. And you're like, that tells you an awful lot about how critics were perceiving the movie walking in. Yeah. It, it, I, something you said earlier about kind of the reason why you wrote the book is because you're basically covering it the way movies get covered now. I do wonder if a movie like this would have been more successful in the modern era of the internet and, you know, that kind of information probably would have gotten out to audiences of what this movie is supposed to be. And, but like the fact that critics just completely seem to not get it is like suspicious almost. Yeah. It's funny because uh, I, I I agree with you. I think that if it was done today, it would have played a lot differently. One of the big pieces of trivia that everybody who loves this movie knows, but that was almost universally missed in in 2001 is the fact that every almost every frame of this movie is saturated with branding and product placement and like that's the joke but none of that was paid for yeah that was something i learned just like reading like the imdb trivia afterwards but some of the reviews you go back and read and there's like oh they're commenting on consumerism but at the same time literally have logos in every shot and it's like how are you not getting this but yeah, also, yeah. yeah, I mean, how are they to and know? And then that also, not again, money? like there is, there is, and I, I tend not to be a conspiracy theorist. I tend to go with the Occam's razor that people Same. aren't thinking or are dumb or what, but, but it is, it's really hard to ignore that this movie came out after Wayne's World. And Wayne's World yeah. is a very male driven, adult driven comedy. And everybody gave them two thumbs up for the Pizza Hut scene. And then you do, basically the exact same thing but you know bigger yeah this uh, in a whole movie, movie is just that girls. pizza hut scene yeah and and then everybody uniformly like not just says this is too much you can't do it but there were a lot of reviews that just didn't seem to get that it was a joke yeah and that's that's the area where i agree with you i'm like that's weird like that's not like that feels like critics who are going out of their way to be obtuse because this is a movie made for teen girls and i don't want to seem like i'm overthinking it and potentially uh get made fun of yeah and i i do wonder if maybe the stigma of like oh like comedies for women almost perceived as like oh well if you like that you're just like a simpleton and maybe yeah. there was like a stigma there of like oh well, i don't want to be the guy who likes josie and the pussycats you know which is as you said something you reveled in the fact that you were yeah which again i mean I do understand that 20 years ago, it was a different time in terms of... Oh, very much so. You know, I mean, even looking at the du jour scene, there's the joke of where there's a song lyric that alludes to them being gay. And when Seth Green touches Donald Faison as they're about to sing it, he like backs off. Uh, And the game, like the, the, the no homo elements of that scene have actually aged remarkably well because they were done kind of uh, empathetically. And like the joke is clearly like the potential that they're gay is not the joke. The idea that 
it's this group of people surrounded by a sea of screaming girls who are trying to hide the potential that there might be any kind of intimacy between them is the joke. Yeah. And so, but also that's a microcosm of how men exposed to any kind of feminine energy in 2000 were kind of portrayed and how they reacted. Yeah. And the, the fact that they don't kind of just throw it in your face is maybe like a little progressive for the time. Um, I, I had a friend recommend a movie to me that was like one of these 2000 sex comedies that I had always heard was like, oh, no, this one's actually kind of good. But uh, it's, it's uh, another Seth Green movie, Sex Drive. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure if you're familiar with that one, but I'm familiar with it, but I've never seen it. OK, so James Marsden is the main character's older brother. And he is very much kind of like the dude bro, like, hey, man, don't be gay. But, you know, a lot of a lot of (laughs) derogatory F-bombs in that one. Mm -hmm. But like it kind of works in that movie because at the end of the movie, he comes out as gay. And it's always Mm -hmm. just like, oh, well, he was it's like weirdly progressive for a a sex comedy that came out in like 2004 or five or something. Yeah, it's funny. That was I feel like there was a moment in our history where that was the that was how you made a character being gay kind of acceptable to a male audience was that you show him as being so overcompensating that even the like dudes in the audience are like bro take a step back that's too much yeah and then you know the the other example is uh uh christopher Oh my gosh, now I've blanked on his name. Chris Cooper's character in American Beauty. Um, yeah. Where, you know, the the like big end of his arc is him going over and kissing Kevin Spacey. Uh, yeah. And that was, it was a very similar kind of vibe in the sense that like, you can get away with having a, a gay character as long as his entire arc is figuring out he's gay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah that the the whole du journess of it, and actually, uh, just saying their name over and over again just reminds me of like how they just keep saying du jour is four different things. Yeah, yeah, that's that was actually that was Alex's thing. Like almost every line he had in the movie was du jour means something. Yeah, uh, du jour means. I'm also friendship. not. I'm also not sure. Do you know what du jour actually means? I actually, uh, you know what? I just had looked it up. Uh, it's it was it's in the IMDb trivia, and I forgot what yeah, it means. It's, it's of the day. It's basically right. this is the, this is the band of the day. This is the band of the moment, and yeah. so it's it's literally a play on their role in pop culture. <laughs> yeah, and like I, it it almost is just like the theme of the movie. Like I love the them kind of figuring out the whole music thing, and Alan mm-hmm. coming goes in the things like, oh yeah, we're gonna crash this plane. Which uh, yeah. was it? Take the Chevy to the levee or whatever, yeah. which is about a plane crash. Um, like it's just all those little kind of moments and comments on the pop culture stuff. I think is the stuff that'll age this movie well. Yeah. I will say uh, this is something again that like I don't think was on purpose at all, but it, it kind of plays nicely. The song that includes the lyric "Take the Chevy to the levee" is actually called "American Pie." Oh so, yeah. So the Tara Reid connection uh, kind of makes that joke. It's like, oh, you can take that joke one, like one number higher. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, so I will say Tara Reid is one of those actresses that I have never been big on. Um, and, you know, given kind of the trajectory of her career, I guess it makes a little more sense. But I, I always was kind of bummed out of like the kind of her character as just being the dumb one in the movie. Mm-hmm. I always just felt like, oh, you know, this this movie is a lot more clever than that. And that always felt like maybe kind of the weakest part of the writing of it. I'm, I'm just curious how you kind of take her character versus how maybe I did. I think that the the thing that they were trying to do, and again, like this is a your mileage may vary thing, uh, but they, they wanted her to be like a court jester kind of character yeah. where on 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 the surface level, she's just a constant stream of giggles and positive energy and, and jokes. But then like she has those break breakthrough moments of like clarity and uh, kind of high mindedness where it's like, 
she'll say the most profound thing in a scene and then people kind of ignore it because it's melody and she's silly. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's the, the moment where they're all in the, in the Starbucks bathroom and Josie says something like, uh, did anybody, you know, do you think there's anything weird about the situation with Wyatt? And she breaks out this whole long, elaborate, essentially psychological breakdown of his character. <laughs> she, based okay, on the way this he, has like, my favorite line napkin. in the movie. Yeah. I actually yeah. have this written down is the way he keeps folding his napkin. Like he doesn't have any real friends. Like yes, that, that yeah. is the line that like made me pause the movie. Cause I was laughing. And, and so like there's bits like, and that's not the only one there's a handful. And it's funny because you, you'll, the flip side to those comments is like, uh, if I could travel back in time, I'd meet Snoopy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so like, certainly she is like, she's definitely, the dumb one in a lot of scenes, but the, the way, the, the way that it, they kind of get away with it for me and the way that it was intended is that she's this kind of court jester character where she kind of sees the world in a different way than everybody else. And every now and again, she'll bust out with something that's really profound. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's really it's funny. This was not one that the filmmakers intended. It was just a happy accident, but even very early on in the movie, when they're watching the news report about du jour, uh, she goes something like, but they didn't say they were dead. They said they were missing. I say, let's, let's uh, put on a bake sale and form a search party. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, towards the end of the movie, when you find out that they're actually alive, it's like, Oh, that actually, if they did that, that might've helped. <laughs> That's, That's true. That would have ended the movie much differently. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even put that together. It's like the, what is it? Like the butterfly flaps, it's the butterfly effect of the movie. If they had just gone out yeah. and searched instead. Uh, and they did, the, when I asked them about that, they were like, oh no, that was just to show that she's relentlessly positive. It wasn't meant to think that she knows they're actually alive. Yeah. But it's one of those, like there are a handful of weird little things in the movie where they aren't there on purpose, but the audience can take something away from them anyway. And that I think helps it to, uh, helps it to resonate with audiences in different ways. You know, one of the things that I, I talked earlier about <clears throat> Babyface's character and the idea that like, there's only like three major characters of color in this whole movie. And two of them are like the ones singled out by the record label for abuse. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people have seen like race as a major element of that. And yeah, like asked, Rosario Dawson's character kind of being the one that's always like pushed aside and like worried that yeah. she's getting cut out of the band. Right. And when I asked Harry and Deb about it, their basic, their take was essentially, well, we needed that dynamic that, and it wouldn't work with Melody because she's too positive and too flighty and she could never have any real animus towards anybody else in the band. Yeah. And so it's like, it's a three person band. It only works with Valerie. And so it was really that simple, but people of color who watch and love this movie have taken a very different thing from the script, including Rosario. When I talked to Rosario about it, she was like, oh yeah, I always thought that was there. Certainly, I think Kenny thought that was there because being in this industry, we experienced that crap, blah, 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 blah. And so like, one of the things that's really interesting to me is when you have, uh, there's like text and subtext and then there's something else. I don't know what you would call it. And I'm sure there's a word for it, I don't know. But it's this thing where like, you've created an accidental subtext. Just like a happy uh, accident. Yeah. And, and so it's, there's a lot of those in this movie where like, and it, and it ranges from just simple jokes. Like there's a joke where uh, uh, there's these girls who were bullies at the beginning of the movie. And once the music starts brainwashing everybody, they show up at Josie's hotel room and they're dressed as the pussycats and they're now their biggest fans. Yeah. And, uh, and the girls like slam the door and they're creeped out. And Alan Cummings says something along the lines of, you know, why are you upset about this? Most people have to wait till their 10 year high school reunion to tell off their, to tell off their bullies. Yeah. And then he like does this little like look off to the side and in, <laughs> in story it's because his, you'll, you'll find out later he was abused in high school and like was everybody's kind of punching bag. And so that's, it's, it's literally just a, a tip of the hand to who he's going to be at the end. But so many people that I've talked to, we're like, oh yeah, that's a that's a great Romeo and Michelle joke because Alan had just done Romeo and Michelle's high school reunion. Yeah, I always and forget he was in that. Yeah, and so it's one of those things where it's like, 
that's not intentional. That's not how they intended it when they wrote it. They didn't know Alan was going to be in the movie when they wrote that line. Yeah. But it's a wonderful little happy accident where people can now take it as like, oh, this is their canon that Alan Cummings character from Josie is at his character from Romeo and Michelle. <laughs> it's a but, cinematic universe I can get behind. Exactly. Uh, and then similarly, uh, there's the scene at the beginning of the movie where uh, Mel- Melody's holding up the sign that says honk if you love pussycats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, the cats gets obscured by a tree and somebody screeches to a halt in front of her and gets rear-ended. Yeah, uh, that, like, that was like watching this for the first time. I was like, oh, I didn't realize this movie was like this. <laughs> like, Yeah, well, in that scene, the guy has red hair. And since yeah. the movie takes place in Riverdale, there have been a lot of fans who were like, oh, that's Archie. Like, that's the Archie cameo. Yeah. And when I asked the directors, they're like, no, we didn't even pick that stuntman. It was, it was a stuntman. If, if he looks like Archie, it's probably because we like put him in a Letterman jacket to make him look younger because he was 40. And it was weird <laughs> that he would be creeping on Tara Reid. Um, yeah. But like, uh, but again, it's this nice little thing where like a, a, a certain percentage of the fans are like, oh yeah, this is the first Archie movie ever made. Of course, Archie's going to have a cameo somewhere. Yeah, which I, I didn't even think about that. This kind of this was the first live action thing in that universe. Yeah, and so far the only live action feature film they've ever made. I mean, it wasn't the first live action thing technically because there was an, a, a variety show in the seventies, like an Archie variety show. And oh, then okay. in nineteen ninety one, there was a TV movie called To Riverdale and Back Again, which was about Archie's high school reunion. Uh, where like an adult Archie comes back to town for the first time and immediately gets swept right back into the love triangle. Yeah. Uh, but, but neither of those, like certainly nothing like a theatrical feature film. Uh, and, and I think in both cases, those were almost immediately forgotten. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know you got to get out of here really soon, but I, I, I feel like we can't walk out on Josie and the Pussycats without talking about the music a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, because honestly, this, um, falls right into my genre of like that age like i was listening to a lot of music of this and like i i ended up buying songs on the soundtrack right after i watched this movie um we, we were yeah. talking a little bit before the show um about the what was it um the the band that kind of did the music which i now letters to cleo uh letters to cleo themselves didn't do the music but Kay hanley who's the lead singer for that band uh is yeah. the singing voice of josie uh and and uh, I, I can't go into it without spending 10 minutes of your time, but I will say <laughs> if you read the chapter of the book that's about the soundtrack, the road to landing on K as the voice was a long and bumpy one. And uh, really? at one point, yeah, at one point they had another girl who they thought was going to be perfect, but she was like a, a young black woman with like a gospel type of voice. And when they put Rachel Lee Cook in front of it, they were like, literally nobody will ever believe that's her voice. Um, and then they landed on Kay, but they were still kind of flirting with the idea of other people. And eventually Kay found out and left and Babyface had to call her at home and be like, come back here. You have the job. Stop. (laughs) Um, and so like, that was crazy. Uh, but yeah, and the writer's room who worked on these songs was just bananas. Uh, Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne, who, uh, wrote, the, the main single of, of the book uh, is the guy who, in addition to being from Fountains of Wayne, he's the guy who wrote That Thing You Do. Uh, oh, the from, movie. You know, the Tom Hanks movie. No, he didn't write the movie. He wrote that song. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, he wrote the, the, so like between that and Three Small Words, it's like, uh, yeah, he's, he's got two of the hookiest pop songs in like movie history. <laughs> Yeah, like three um, three small words has literally been stuck in my head since I watched this movie. Uh, and uh, then you had, um, like I said, Kay Hanley was in the writers' room. She, he wrote one. Um, she wrote one of the songs, "Shapeshifter," uh, which is only on the soundtrack. It's not in the movie. But then, uh, or you know what? I'm I'm wrong. By the way, uh, Adam wrote "Pretend to Be Nice," which is the main single from the movie. Yeah. Two small words is just the catchiest song, and that was actually uh, I'm sure the, the the writers' room had input on it, but it's it's technically written by Harry and Deb, the directors. 
yeah um, that that is that is incredibly catchy but pretend to be nice also a very good song like i went and bought yeah. three small words but i was hovering over pretend to be nice and i was like oh maybe another day but i will yeah, probably they, end up with also, that one too they had um uh jane weedland from the go-go's who as i told you off mic is the singing tele- telegram girl from clue uh was in the writer's room and then adam duritz from counting crows and Anna Warrenker from this kind of indie nineties band called that dog. And uh, it's funny. If you go on YouTube, you can find Anna Warrenker actually recorded her song, uh, which was uh, I wish you well. Uh, oh, okay. For one of her own records later. Oh, and nice. so there, there are a couple of songs from the Josie soundtrack that have been covered uh, by the people who wrote them years later. You know, there's a video out there someplace where Schlesinger is playing pretend to be nice. And his whole intro is basically just a joke where he's like, <laughs> Hey, this movie that bombed, isn't that the biggest movie you've ever seen? Clearly, you know, this song. <laughs> um, That's funny. But, uh, uh, and, and Schlesinger also had ties to one of the oddest things that I did with the book which was I had a long interview with uh, a Simpsons writer named Tim Long. And mm-hmm. uh, Adam was friends with Tim Long and they were working on a project when Adam passed away. He actually, he died of COVID uh, last oh, April. Um, but uh, Tim had written this episode of the Simpsons called New Kids on the Black, mm-hmm. where Bart uh, gets recruited into a boy band that is secretly using subliminal messages to s- recruit people for the <laughs> army. Sounds familiar. And that's that episode came out th- two months before Josie came out in theaters. So oh, really neither could possibly have been influenced by the other. It was a total weird coincidence that they had basically the same plot. And uh, so I, I, it's one of those things that comes up in trivia all the time. People are like, Oh yeah. Do you know there was that Simpsons episode that was basically the same story and like uh, it, it starred in sync as the guests. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I like reached out and I was just like, Hey, would you be willing to talk about Josie and the Pussycats? And he was like, actually, I have a really fun story about that, that I've never told anybody because as far as I can tell, I'm the only person who's ever asked Tim long. Hey, isn't <laughs> it weird that your episode's exactly Josie and the Pussycats? Um, but he, he, he was very young when that episode aired. And when he read the Simpsons did the same thing better, he was young enough to not quite know how things work and legitimately was like, Oh shit, they stole my idea. Yeah. And so he didn't watch the movie for years. Cause he was like, no, <laughs> screw those guys. And then like, he had a girlfriend a few years back who was like, no, you sit down and watch this movie with me. It's terrific. And like they watched it and he was like, this is such a delightful movie. I love it. And like now that I'm a little older and I know how the industry actually works, I know that there's no way either of us could have stolen from the other. <laughs> like, yeah, it was just the and, Armageddon and deep impact of their time. It, exactly. And, you know, it's it's but uh, it's funny because Tim has like in the years since like he was a head writer for Letterman for a while. He's like he's incredibly accomplished. But when I was like, hey, do you want to talk to me about this movie you had nothing to do with? He gave me like an hour and a half of his time and a bunch of great Simpsons anecdotes. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that he told me that didn't even end up in the book because there was just it was, it's an oral history. So like you got to follow a timeline, at least loosely. And like, yeah. I don't have a lot of room for Simpsons distractions, but I am 100 percent. I'm actually releasing an ebook that is a companion to best movie ever. And what, what that's going to be is basically here's all the really good stuff that didn't make the book for practical reasons. Yeah. And so uh, that's going to be in there. And a bunch of the, the conversation I had with uh, Tom Butler, who plays Asian Kelly in the movie. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's a lot of fun. He, he is so much. Fun. And it's funny because Tom, Tom loved Josie and he loved specifically the line he got to deliver where he came in and said, Holy shit, that girl's got a skunk on her head. Uh, and he not only told me two or three times how much he loved that line but clearly it's something that has come up in other conversations because when i was talking to hiro kanagawa 
hero was like, yeah. And I've been friends with Tom Butler for years. And Tom always tells me how much he loves that line. Uh, Holy shit. That girl's got a skunk on her head. And the thing about it is I talked to hero two months before I ever talked to Tom. So it's not like I talked to Tom and then he mentioned the book to hero. And yeah. hero was like, Oh yeah. He's been talking about that the last couple. Of- no, it's like he mentioned this enough times in the intervening 20 years that that's what hero Kanagawa remembers from Tom. <laughs> uh, it's always, um, but like, also, like you remember like, these like, movies. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to, he's a great character actor. Like one of the things that uh, I'm going to put in the like little, uh, companion book that i'll share with you here because i think it's a cool story um he plays one of the main girl's dads in uh freddy versus jason oh yeah and there's a scene where he has to break down the door to try to wake her up so freddy can't get to her Mm -hmm. and apparently they only had one door so there was only basically one take for this yeah and they locked it on him and so while breaking the door down he injured himself like oh wonderful a finger and scraped his face up and that's the take that's in the movie because they didn't have another door to break (laughs) yeah it's like this is it this is what we have to get it in one yeah yeah so like weird things like that i'm like man i love stuff like that and like the idea that like i got a really cool random freddy versus jason anecdote in my josie and the pussycats interview (laughs) (laughs) yeah Uh, just the weird osmosis of hollywood oh yeah i talked to uh Maddie Libatik, who was the cinematographer on Josie, and he's gone on to be a huge deal since because he works with uh, Darren Aronofsky all the time, and he oh, shot okay. uh, the first two Iron Man movies and Birds of Prey and a bunch of stuff like that. Oh wow! And when I was talking to him about how he ended up on Josie because he had just come off of Requiem for a Dream and then Tigerland and then Josie and the Pussycats, and I was like, "How'd that happen?" And he was like, "Oh, it's because Darren was supposed to be doing Batman," and. Darren Aronofsky yeah. wanted me to shoot Batman year one, but I was worried that Warner brothers was going to say I didn't have enough studio experience. So I took a big flashy studio movie that was clearly meant to be a big, like commercial success because I wanted to show that I could shoot like a regular movie that wasn't hyper stylized. Uh, and then a, this movie was hyper stylized B it was a flop. So it probably wouldn't have helped him and C, by the time <laughs> Josie was done, Darren had passed on Batman. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, but it's like, here's this, a window into this moment in time where it's like, yeah, Matthew Lebetique ended up shooting Josie and the Pussycats because he wanted a Batman job. <laughs> That's funny. The, which that Darren Aronofsky Batman was the first episode of my previous podcast where we would look at scripts for movies that never happened. Oh, nice. I'll have to yeah. check that out because I actually I just yesterday bought a book about the, like the best movies that never happened. I can't remember. Uh, Underexposed, it's called. OK, yeah, I'm going to look that up because, yeah, that was my previous podcast, which it's it's the same podcast feeds while those episodes are there. So anybody yeah, listening yeah. can go check out those. That, that makes well. sense, because I did notice that prior to your first episode, you had the Zack Snyder's Justice League thing. Yeah, that was like the last episode of the previous podcast is we did a we did the review for the Snyder cut. But yeah, it was it was the shelved film podcast and it was all about um, reading screenplays and stuff. And it it just was too much work for a day job. So, you know, it's funny because I I don't think I ever listened to your show, but I did follow you guys on Twitter because you guys were so cool. (laughs) Oh, well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it was a, it was a fun podcast and I'm still trying to continue that stuff on the Patreon here, but, uh, mm-hmm. it, it just became way too much work to get, to f- read the script, get a guest to read the script and then find time to record and stuff. And so yeah, I was like, no, well, I'm con- yeah, this is a lot more fun and just easier to do. Like, Hey, anyone can watch a movie and talk about it, yeah. but not it's everybody funny. can write a book about a movie. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. One of the people I talked to for the book is this guy, Dave Baker. He's a comic book artist, but he also has a podcast called Deep Cuts, which is about like weird pop culture stuff. Like he has an episode about how Christopher Nolan's brother is wanted for murder in Central America. Oh, Um, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, he he actually got convicted, but then the U.S. essentially swooped in and rescued him. And so like, I can't remember what country it is that he's wanted in, but like, there's a place he can't go back to. <laughs> That's wild. Um, but so uh, the, his show, he did like a four hour epic episode about, um, and now of course I'm forgetting his name, but the guy who directed primer and mm, yeah. how 
after Primer, he has these two wildly creative, insanely ambitious, unproduced screenplays that he could just never find, like never get the money for. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so they did like a four hour thing where they basically looked at both of those scripts and all three of the movies he's actually made. And we're like, so what's this guy's deal? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to check that out. Yeah. I'll send you a link to that episode. Uh, they deep cuts. Actually that, that podcast is one of the uh, fake corporate sponsors that I have for the book. Each chapter <laughs> is presented to you by a new uh, company or entity. Oh, nice. Uh, because, because uh, even though I got no money from any of those people for advertising, uh, in the same, you know, I'm writing a book about Josie and the Pussycats. So there were certain things I had to do. I, I have fake corporate sponsors. I have a, uh, a subliminal message planted in my introduction. <laughs> and then I have uh, a Mr. Movie Phone style uh, additional subliminal message that I had my, uh, my book designer put in that talks about how I'm, she's too good for me. And wouldn't it all be, wouldn't it be cool to be as pretty and popular as she is? That's funny. I mean, life imitating art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I figure I, it's, it's, I, I talk about a lot of serious stuff in the book. I talk ab- about the movie seriously, but I still wanted to have some level of fun and some level of kind of acknowledgement that like, I'm, we're doing a book about the Josie and the Pussycats movie. Yeah. Uh, and, and not take it so seriously that, uh, you turn off the people who are here because this was a fun, funny, like moment of their childhood. Yeah. And honestly, I, I highly recommend everybody should check out the movie and everybody should absolutely check out your book. So where can they find it? Uh, you can pre-order the, or, nah, the book's out today. So I have to change yeah. my, my uh, you can order the ebook from Amazon. Uh, I am having some very serious problems with formatting uh, the physical printed book from Amazon. Uh, they they don't like my format, and since I'm self published, I was like, well, I'll just use Kindle Direct Publishing, and that'll be easy. But it's not been easy. So if you want a physical <laughs> copy of the book, you can go to josiebook.com. I do have them. I can show them to you. Amazon is simply not cooperating right now so you can pre-order the ebook either from amazon or josiebook.com if you want a physical book go to josiebook.com i will say uh because i am a physical media nut and a former video store owner yep. if you buy a physical book from me you get a free ebook basically as soon as i can check my email and get it off to you so well, right. if you really don't want a physical book feel free to buy an ebook wherever you want but if you have any interest at all in owning a physical copy it's like two bucks more and you get the free ebook right away. Yeah. I, I am the physical copy guy, so I will absolutely be picking one of those up. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Russ Burlingame, which is R U S S B U R L I N G A M E. And I always say that's really long and I'm not going to repeat it. So uh, <laughs> if you want to, if, if you want to, to, if you couldn't get that the first time, Josie book. <laughs> everybody's got a rewind feature also it'll be tagged in the show notes so feel yeah. free to just scroll down there and click it we'll also have the website down there you can just click to so you can order it from straight from there and make it easy for you nice. all right yeah, and if i was if i was more sophisticated i could give you like some kind of affiliate link or something but uh, I'm, I'm just not that clever yeah <laughs> um, i'm a rinky dink operation know, actually, myself so <laughs> what what i'll do is uh i'll 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 set this up tonight so that I don't forget. If you enter uh, coup- if you enter coupon code defend at josiebook.com, oh. you'll get twenty percent off. Well, there you go. Get your get yourself a little discount and pick up uh, pick up this great book on this great movie. I I I honestly like didn't know what to expect going into the film and came out as a fan, like legitimately. So yeah, that's, I, that is a very common, like a, a lot of people, I think just, you see it, you think you know what it is because why wouldn't you know what it is? It's a property that's been around for 50 years and hasn't changed much. And so uh, you, you watch the thing and you're like, Oh, that wasn't at all what I was expecting. And it was a really pleasant surprise. Yeah. Uh, th- that was easily my experience with it, but you know, I, I bought it. I bought a digital copy to watch it for the, for the show and i've and i've ended up with some pretty crummy movies for that same reason but this is one yeah. i'm like oh i will a thousand percent watch this again 
All right. Well, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a, a pleasure get, getting a chance to actually speak with you in person instead of on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been in each other's mentions for a while. It's uh, it's nice yeah, to sit exactly. down and actually talk to you. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. No, thank you for being here. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And be sure to go check out the book. All the links will be in the show notes.